Hey guys, I am excited today. You know, some of us are at retirement age. Some of us have retired. Some of us are thinking about it. So I have someone here who's going to tell you about her new book, The 60 Something Crisis. We have Miss Barbara Pagano. Got it. Yes. Good. From, the, Thank you. from Italy, but she's going to be here to talk to us about her book and some other things because she's fascinating. When I was researching her, I came up with some things I didn't think I could do, but she did. How are you doing, Barbara? It's a beautiful day in Nashville, Tennessee, so I hope everybody else is having a beautiful day. It's kind of the end of the summer, and we're getting ready for fall. I mean, it's nice down here in Texas and it looks like it might rain, but not like it did last week. So, so we're thankful. Okay. Your book, The 60 Some Crisis, yes, we're going to talk about it, but I wanted to jump back because when I was researching you, I found out that you did a boating expedition <laughs> and I was like, I don't know if I could do it, but tell us a little bit about that and, and what brought it on. Well, my husband and I had a sailboat in the Caribbean, which we would on vacation get down as often as we could. Um, but I mostly uh, did not participate actively in, in the sailing, but I loved it. I absolutely loved being on that boat. So when 9-11 happened and my calendar became uh, clear for a while because nobody was traveling. I had um, brought the boat back up to Pensacola and I simply turned to my daughter and said, how would you feel about getting in this boat and just seeing how far we could go? And Marisha, I have to say that at that time, life was very good. I was very comfortable, meaning that there wasn't anything that I was really challenging myself to do. Mm -hmm. I hadn't been afraid in a long time. I mean, sometimes when you're in front of corporate audiences, you can get a little quivery. But as far as doing something that I, I didn't know if I could do, that had not been on the radar. Mm -hmm. And it became very important to me to try this. Uh, just to see if I could do it. Now, maybe I would leave Pensacola and just get to Destin. That would be as far as I could go. Um, and our skill set was nominal. But what I found out is that it, if you have a high desire to do something, then that skill set, you'll learn that skill set. You'll learn as much as you need to, to know about getting from point A to point B. So I asked my daughter at that time, who was in her late 30s, and I was in my late 50s, what, do you want to go? And she was coming out of a, an on-again, off-again relationship, and she said, yeah. So the two of us, mother and daughter, did leave Pensacola, and we sailed for over 2,000 miles and six months. And it was... First of all, it was an adventure being with an adult child mm -hmm. for 24-7. Mm -hmm. And she is my only daughter. And that was really uh, important uh, in terms of the time. But the experience, hey, um, it was scary. Mm -hmm. uh, people said, you can't do this. Uh, you don't know enough about sailing to do this. And we said, we will... Uh, make the best decisions that we can make. And I changed in that six months. So thank you for asking about that trip. It was uh, instrumental in who I am today. Uh, and I learned a lot about myself. And yeah, it was good. It just seemed like, and I thought I had done something when I zip lined, but it was like, I remember when I did zip line, um, the, the instructor told us, if you start turning the wrong way, mm -hmm. don't, don't get frightened. He said, we can, we can come and get you, but I'll show you how to get to the other side if you start turning. Well, you know me, I started turning. So they said, we'll send it. I said, no, 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 no. I listened. I know how to do it. So I, you know, put my hands up there and I did the little thing and I got there. Not saying I will ever do this again, but mm -hmm. it, was, it, was, it was very interesting. It was something that, 
I thought I wanted to do. So I did it. I, I admire you because I've been on a cruise ship and look out and I just see water. And I'm like, I can't drink up all this water. <laughs> Well, one of the things I want to share with um, the people who are listening is that we did not have a lot of support to do this. More people said, this is dangerous. Mm -hmm. You don't have enough skills to do this. Uh, they were right about both of those things. Mm -hmm. um, okay, I flunked out of navigation school. I did go to school to try to learn navigation. I didn't do, that test was really hard. My daughter went to sailing school for a week. Um, and, and, and learn some basics. But what you're looking at is a, a group of people who told us, you, you can't do this, this is too dangerous. And we said, you know, we're, we're two very capable, smart women. We're gonna go try mm -hmm. and we'll make the best decisions that we can make. And I, I think that, so many times we get into a life situation and we know that we want to try this, but don't look for a lot of people out there to go rah, rah, rah. And uh, I will add one piece. There were a lot of people who wanted us to carry a gun. Yeah. And we said, I said, absolutely not. Um, we were getting into some dangerous waters. I and thought about that when I was reading it because I keep thinking about pirates. Yeah. Yes. And that's that, that's a very realistic kind of thing to think about. Um, my daughter said, oh, Mom, I'll go to gun school and learn how to do this. And I said, absolutely not. I'm not carrying a gun. But we did carry a blow up man. <laughs> OK, seriously, we dressed him in my husband's clothes and we brought him up to the cockpit one time mm -hmm. just to let the area know that we did have a big, strong guy on board. So um, we, we made the best decisions that we could make. Yeah, the big, strong guy that if you stuck a pin in him, he'd be gone. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. You know, retirement is it's different as you stated in your book than it was for our parents. Mm -hmm. And I go back and I think about it because I, I visited Barbados one time and I just fell in love. I was like, I could live here. And then I came home and read, and I don't know who wrote it. It was a guy talking about retirement. He said, people always think they can retire and just walk the beach. He said, because you're there for a week. Mm -hmm. He said, so think about being there for every day. He said, could you do it every day? What are you going to do every day? And I go back to Cicely Tyson, and, and in one of her books, she wrote, you have to retire to something. Yes. That, that fascinated me. How old were you when you retired the first time? I failed at retirement uh, at 65. Okay, that's the magic year where mm -hmm. you sit down and uh, it just, whether you like it or not, the world starts changing a little bit. People mm -hmm. find out that you're 65 and they begin to ask questions. Well, what are you going to do now? When are you going to retire? And I sat down and explained in the book that I had options, um, but I also sat with a cup of coffee looking out at the water for almost um, a little over two and a half years. Mm -hmm. not, not depressed, majorly confused about where I was in life and what I wanted to do and what all of this meant to me. And I operated on an old map of life, which our parents operated very successfully on that map. Mm -hmm. And many people today are operating on that map. It's the map where you get educated and then you work. And then there's this magic little place where you stop working. And it, it was a good map for a long period of time. Mm -hmm. But I became a student. I said, what's going on with me? I have degrees in human behavior. I, I, I should know what this transition is all about. And I did not fully understand that it would be one of the biggest transitions and one of the hardest transitions that I would ever make. Did your friends ever say, well, you, you know, you could just retire and just rest. It's like when they said that, it makes me always think that I was doing hard labor, you know, and then but a lot of people, well, 
people our age, and when I say our age, I'm, I'm close to your age. Mm -hmm. And I, oh, happy birthday, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, you know, when you think about it, everybody is different. Every, everybody, some people want to continue to work. You wrote in your book, it, it's kind of like, it's not an opportunity to do you because your children are basically grown. Um, more than likely your home is paid for. You know, you've said you were gonna go on this trip, but you've never made it to this trip. And I go back to my friends that have retired. One told me, she said, I spent the first year in retirement going to doctors. She said, I never went to doctors the way I'm going now. And so we never want to get to, we told each other, we never want to get to the point where we said, my doctor, that makes it sound like that's all we're going to talk about. Just say you went to the doctor, I'm trying to get it straight now. What was the first thing you, you, you said you said, and you looked out the window, what were some of the other things you did in your, your year of retirement that didn't go well? Well, I, I want to latch on to what you just said, and that is people have plenty of ideas about what you should do. Uh, I had many of my friends said, Barbara, you've had a good life. It's now for you to make the world a better place and, you know, volunteer. And well, I, I looked at my life and I had been making the world a better place and I had volunteered and I had given my time and talents uh, to make the world a better place, but I didn't think that that was going to be fulfilling to me. And I would go in the bookstore and, and ask for the section um, in the information booth. I'd say, I need to go to the section around aging and really living a good life. And they would say, oh, we don't have a section on that. <laughs> And so they would take me over to the self-help section, mm -hmm. which of course I'd been there many times during my life. And I, I had to go looking for answers. Mm -hmm. So I was majorly confused about what longevity meant to me. Uh, in the beginning, I was thinking, okay, the average woman lives to be 76 or 77, or, you know, that's changing. Um, so part of me thought, well, 65, 70, well, that's not too long. So maybe investing in something isn't really what you want to do. Maybe you should just rest for the next 10 years. And then the more I studied, I understood that those averages about your time on this earth are not going to fit most of us. Mm -hmm. And when I put in all of my information to one of these um, studies and looked at my family, I, I, the number that came up was 98. Mm -hmm. Okay, 65 to 98. Whoa, uh -huh. big time. Mm -hmm. So there were some big ahas along the way about the long, length of time that I had ahead of me. Now, whether or not that will happen, none of us really know. But if you don't plan for it, then, you, then you're just going to be coasting along. And the other thing that I learned was that I, I really did want to work. Not like I worked in my 50s or my 40s or 80 hours a week or anything like that. But I did want to work for several reasons. Number one, it was fulfilling to me. Okay, I was helping people. I didn't know exactly what I was going to do, but I did have a skill set. Number two, my financial advisor had told me that maybe he wasn't going to run our money until 90. He was now going to run it until 100. <laughs> We're like going, whoa, how do you take that little pile of money that you were good about saving and now stretch it out for another 10 years? I had grandchildren late in life. I never had a, a line item for grandchildren that looked really good in $60 shoes. Mm -hmm. So I, I investigated that sometimes we think as we get older, making money should not be a high priority. Well, then you look at the statistics that says retirees number one concern of, is, is worrying about money. Yes. So we have to educate ourselves, which is what I did, and understand that we can be content with our life, but we can also have ambition. And that ambition can be about fulfillment and also making money. And your financial person will tell you, if you can bring in $300 a month 
or $3,000 a month and not dip into assets, then you're not going to be having that big worry that so many retirees have. So that, I was very much educated in those two and a half years. That, that is so true because I retired first at 56. I came out of public school. I had a position there. Okay. And I went back to teaching at the community college. I left public school in May. I went back to work in August, but I signed my contract in May. And I was excited because I like teaching. And I said I would do it for 10 years. And uh -huh. I've done it for 12. And when I left, I, I remember somebody saying, why? I said, well, I figured out that I didn't do, I didn't want to learn one more thing that all I could do with it was teach. I said, it was time to move on and to do something else. But I remember a young lady told me one time, she didn't know why people my age didn't retire and let the younger ones have a job. Oh, and I thought to myself, I found one, so you can find one, you know, that, that's it. You have four portals, and I think those four portals are so important. Tell us about them. Tell us about the first one. Well, one of the things I wanted to add to what you're saying, and then I'll get to the portals, which is um, a very important piece of the book, is that there was my story and how I was feeling and what I was learning, mm -hmm. but I also had coached leaders at the top of organizations. They were CFOs and SVPs and CEOs, and they had retired. Mm -hmm. And I went back to them and interviewed them and said, how are you doing? And they gave me the information that made me want to write about this because they said, I didn't do that well. I did not think through exactly what it was that life was going to mean to me. I had the party, I shut the door, I had a great career, I went traveling for a year, I cleaned out the attic, you know, whatever. And now I'm looking at life and Barbara, I didn't do that well. So it's fair, I've always been a uh, nuts and bolts person. Mm -hmm. I, I have to have a guide. And what I have written about in the four portals is that as I did my research, in interviews and in classes and in studies, there were four areas that you really need to look at. Mm -hmm. And the first one is geography of place. You have to find that place where your heart sings. And it's probably not gonna be on one of those lists about the best places to live in retirement, <laughs> um, unless it really, th this is a heartfelt thing. This is a place where your spirit feels good. It can be by a creek. It can be in the mountains. It can be by the water. It can be in a city. But we have places that are tied to happiness that nourish our souls. Now, where is that? And one man I interviewed said, well, I'm, I'm, I want to move to Arizona. And I said, great. I said, where do you want to go in Arizona? And he said, well, I don't know, Barbara. I've never been. I read it. I read it. So I'm like, we have to go explore. Maybe people listening to this already know their geography of place, but maybe you don't. Maybe it's your hometown and maybe you need to go explore and find out where that place is. But we cannot underestimate the joy from your kitchen window or your office window or your walk down the street or your walk in the mountains. We cannot underestimate how that feeds directly into your well-being. So that's the first portal. You said that, but uh, my best girlfriend, who I've known since we were in second grade, they lived in this huge house and they had one child. And as time went on, she called me one day and she said, we're going to sell the house. And I was like, where are you going? They moved into, uh, uh, um, she calls it a retirement community, but they moved into one. She said, it's the best for us. Okay. That's where she lives. And when I go, I like it, but it's not for me. It's, it's just not for me, but she told me, she said, it's the best for us. She said, I was tired of the house. Nobody, you know, it was, it was too big for two people. We didn't go upstairs and we didn't do that. She said, but now I can do all the things that I want to do. She said, he's happy and I'm happy. So, you know, you, 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 you kind of think of those things, but like you said, we have to kind of figure out where we want to go. But the man that was going to Arizona, 
Well, Scottsdale is different than some other place that, you know, than Phoenix. So you have to kind of figure out where you want to live. You know, I could say I want to go back home to my hometown, but it's not the hometown that I left 50 years ago. It's grown all together differently than what I remember. So, yeah. And, and you know, traveling as a traveler back to these places is not the same as looking for your geography of place. Mm -hmm. You have to put different eyes on it and say, how do I feel? Will this be a community that I can make friends in, that I can do my work in, that uh, gives me joy? For some people, that's the middle of a big city. They want to go around the corner and go in the deli. And, the, and, the, and for you and I, we may need mountains or blue sky or whatever. Now, if you can't get to that geography, a place to live, mm -hmm. then you've got to design a life to get there as often as you can. Okay. But that's the first portal. Okay. Where do you want to be? Thank you. Yeah. Where do you want to be? What's the second portal? Well, the second portal is what I call yield. And, um, you know, my daughter is um, in her early 50s right now. And she will say, Mom, don't tell them they can't retire because they won't like you. OK, you can retire, but maybe 65 is not your retirement age. And I'm talking about the old definition of retirement because that's certainly a word that, you know, is getting a lot of different def definitions on retirement or, or whatever you want to call it. Maybe 85 is the place where mm -hmm. you truly sit down and say, I'm not going to do my work anymore. When I looked at yields, um, that was a, when I looked at work, the word yield became very important to me. And that is, okay, if I'm going to choose something to develop my talents and use my potential, what is it that I want back? Do I want money? Do I want the opportunity to help people? Do I want the opportunity to take this, this work that I want to do all over the world so I can do it from any place. What do I want back? And for many of us, we, well, for many people, um, the investment in jobs that they did not like mm -hmm. uh, and did not were and not engaged in, um, that happens to a lot of people for many, many years. But now you have the opportunity to say, what do I want back? Uh, do I want to be creative? Do I want an opportunity to grow a business? Mm -hmm. And when you decide yield, then that gives you the reason for putting your time and talents into some semblance of work that is going to be meaningful to you. For instance, one of the things that I investigated when I looked at, well, what do I want back? It was, I wanted the ability to use my, my talents mm -hmm. and I could use that being a negotiator. Mm -hmm. But, and I would go to Harvard and give them $10,000 and get a negotiation certificate. To, but what that was going to do is it was going to tie me geographically to a place. And I did not want that. So the second portal is yield and asking, what do you want back? A little bit of money, mm -hmm. a lot of money, grow a business. And I'm sure that as you developed after your teaching at college, you, you were in a way asking, well, what do I want back right now in my life? You know, even when I was there, it was, it was a conscious effort. It was like, it's so different teaching there than it was in public school because you had time, you know, if you had a class here, you might not have a class the next time, or you could have it online we, because we had gone online one semester before the pandemic. So you were at home all the time. You had, you had time to do other things. You know, you could do, a, a, you could have other ideas, other adventures, other careers. I, I knew a lot of people that, that did real estate, you know, they were yes. writing a book because they had the time. So they were, you know, teachers don't get paid, even college teachers don't get paid a whole bunch, but they were bringing in money, which they said they were going to, you know, move to, to their retirement or whatever. And I, I, that's, that's interesting. You know, I never thought about you say, so, you know, you go to Harvard and that was one of my places I had to visit. I had to stand on the yard of Harvard and I'd oh, be okay. 
Uh, but you say it ties you to one place. And again, everybody is different. I read where you talked about, you, and one example was the lady that, um, that house set in all the oh, different yeah. countries. You know, I, 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 don't, I don't think it would be me because I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm a scary person, but it just made me think of all the things, all the things. And my mother used to always say, if it works for you, you know, I've been married 44 years and people said, what's the secret? I said, it works for us. It might yeah. not work for you. You know what we do. You, you, you might be completely different. Yeah, that is so good. Well, in the example of the person who, um, did the house sitting uh, around the world for five years and is still doing it. Um, travel, what did she want back? She wanted the ability to see the world. Mm -hmm. How was she going to do that? In her financial situation, mm -hmm. how was she going to make that happen? And so that, that's a great story of looking at what she wanted back, the number one thing. And I also think that, you know, in the beginning, when I would um, talk to people about work, that, that when I said that word, they would go, well, I, I don't want to work. OK, mm -hmm. I don't want to work anymore. And so I needed to be able to look at work. And I still think it's a, a good word um, in a way that made it much more appealing for those mm -hmm. of us at 65 who are now looking to invest our time and talents, not in work that we don't like. But I also think it's important to say, you know, we also, we are we're sometimes told to, to that we have to love our work. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, there were some days I didn't love writing that book. <laughs> okay. Yeah, Cause it was hard work, mm -hmm. but I think if you like something and you really like it, then the love floats in and out of that. Thank so, you. you know, there are certain days that I'm sure you find that, you know, the work that you love is just going to be light today. Yeah, I, I tell everybody, I love teaching. I, I just truly enjoyed it, but it was some days it's like, no, not, this is not going to be a good day. Okay, what's the third portal? Well, the third portal, we touched on it a little bit, is what I call kinship. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, when you get to, we've all seen the studies where that uptick goes happy, 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 happy. And then you get to, they say, oh, isn't that great? We're going to get happier as we get to get older. Mm -hmm. Well, if you look into the research, when that gets to be about 70, that starts going like this and loneliness starts to happen and suicide is on the increase for those That's of us surprising. who get older. And so we have to look at where we are spending our time and energy uh, in our relationships with people. We do very well with that with family, okay? We, we spend time and energy with our families. Where we don't spend time and energy after the age of 65 and in the last third of life is making new friends. Mm -hmm. Okay, we seem to think that we're, all these friends that we had before are gonna carry us through to the end of our life. Well, there's a one section of the book that says, well, maybe those friends aren't good friends anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay, maybe they don't um, nurture your spirit. Maybe they're rude. Maybe their values have changed. And there is a culling of friendships that needs to happen where you are making decisions about family and friends and who you're going to spend time with and who you're not going to spend time with. Mm -hmm. So that's a part of looking at the people in your life and saying, okay, what kind of boundaries do I need to draw around myself for me? Mm -hmm. And how am I going, how now am I going to make, we're a little rusty making new friends at 65. So we have to learn how to do that. And then we also, you know, you talked about having a long marriage and now we have to look at our marriages. Mm -hmm. And in my marriage, my husband's geography of place is different than my geography, I my, my yeah. geography of place. Mm -hmm. And so what do you do when that happens? Well, what you do is, or what we have done is to honor one another. And so we are very married. We had just celebrated 42 years together. We live in different cities. 
and we visit back and forth. It's called Married But Living Apart. There are many couples that are doing it. Uh, and, it kids, works for, and it works for you. It works for us. Mm -hmm. The kids were majorly confused <laughs> in the beginning. They said, are you getting divorced? Mm -hmm. And we said, no, we love one another. We respect one another, but she wants to be in Nashville close to two grandkids. And I still love Pensacola. So that was another area. So the, the, the portal, the third portal of kinship, and when we say portal, all we're talking about is opening a doorway mm -hmm. and jumping down and looking at where do I want to be? What do I want to do with my time and energy? Who do I want to be with? Mm -hmm. And then the very fourth portal is this wonderful opportunity that many of us have in the last third of a life. And we have freedom. Okay. And that is a very important, you know, when you talk to people who are getting ready to retire, they mm -hmm. want that freedom. They want that time. And they want that choice of what to do with their life. So that's great. But what is it that you want to do? And I think that's where a lot of people who are getting to retirement age, they have not thought that part out. They just said 65 I'm out. What are you going to do? Oh, I'm going to rest. I'm going to build a deck. I'm going to do this. Uh, and I think one thing that they forget is maybe their kinship people aren't retired too. You know, that's yeah. the big thing. You know, you retire, but your friend did not. So they can't go because my good friend took a buyout and she's a couple of years younger than me. And then circumstances had her go back to work time that I retired. And I'm like, well, well, that's a bummer, you know, but that's what happens. Life gets in the way. So, I and you know, yeah. And, you know, when you're looking at this transition in life and for me and much of the research is supporting this, um, this is a big, big life transition. And we can talk about longevity. But there are a couple of other things that uh, really uh, got my attention. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that got my attention is that, Marisha, in the last 50 years, the research has not changed. Mm -hmm. We are getting to the end of life mm -hmm. with a major regret. And that regret is, I have not lived my life the way that I wanted to live my life. And when I thought about that and thought, holy moly, nothing has changed in the last 50 years and we are still getting to the end of life saying, I wish I had had more courage to take a, a, a risk and do something, or I wish I had not lived my life for other people. I, I thought we've got to change that. We've got to get to the end of our lives and say, I gave it my best shot. And so that was very inspirational to me to understand that we have a reason to do this work. And it's a really important reason um, if you care about getting to the end and looking back and saying, did it as well as I could do it. You know, and I, I think that's an important part that you that you said, because I can go back to my mom. Um, I, my dad died when I was a junior in college, but my mom was going to retire in that December. She taught school, but she died that October. And her thing was she was going to travel and do all these things. She did get a chance to do a little bit of it because when we were growing up, she didn't she didn't hang out and she didn't do a lot of clubs and sororities and all that. But when we were all gone away from home, she said, I'm going to go back to the sorority because I can travel with them. And so she was able to do that. And one thing that I've done, too, is before I left my last position, there was a women's club. And I like I like smart women. I tell all my students I love smart women okay. and I joined this organization so that I can meet other people who are not necessarily educators. Mm -hmm. yeah, you, you want to learn more than than just our point of view because we tend to basically all think alike you know so we want to learn other things but I and you, back to kinship I just I just think that is so important and you didn't say it but you have to realize that somebody's going to go home to meet Jesus you know somebody <laughs> death, death, death will happen you know I and 
like in my class now, I'm on a Facebook group at my class at home and look like every looks like every other week something is happening to somebody. So those things happen too. And I think it's okay that you are grow some friends or they're not the same as they were when you were 20 and 30. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of people I know are moving in with their children, you know, that they're building a new house and the children are saying we have a a wing for their moms and dads or whatever. But I have a friend there and she says, I don't want to do it. She said, I'm healthy. And she's a good 10 years older than me. She said, I'm healthy. I have relatives here, not a lot. My church is here and my friends are here. So I don't want to move with them. So, you know, you have to do again what you said is good for you. You do. And I think that uh, one of the things I'm finding in promoting the book is that you and, and I talk about leading an extraordinary life. Mm -hmm. And for many people, they look at the word extraordinary and go, whoa, that's just, that's way too big for me. Mm -hmm. But if you break that word down, you have ordinary and you have a little extra. So most of us are would, you know, we're not climbing mountains or or you know, running the ultra marathons or or crossing, you know, we're not rowing the Atlantic or anything like that. We're living our lives. And we have family and friends and some of us have mortgages and, and all that. So we're ordinary. But what is that little place? You know, one guy I interviewed said, look, Barbara, don't get me wrong. He was retired five years. And there were some issues that we had uncovered. But he said, don't get me wrong. I'm happy. But it could be happier. Okay. What's the, what's the distance between happy and happier? So many of us can look at extraordinary and own it, okay? It's my life. What do I want to do? Do I know myself? Do I know, am I living the life that I meant to live? Mm -hmm. And I think that at 65, it's, it's so important. Um, and, you know, 50 year olds are, are contacting me saying, I need this book now. Mm -hmm. So I can begin to make changes for my they need a roadmap before they get to 65, because right. once you get to 65 and something you said, the 70s sneak up on you. <laughs> they do. They do. And, and you start thinking, you know, I wasted all that in my 60s. Now I'm about to hit 70. So 70 is so many people say that the researchers say that the transition from 60 to 70 is one of the most critical pieces that you will in your lifetime, that that's a really critical age. It looks very different at 70. And you know, it looks different because it is different. Um, last week, my grandson who is 10, I picked him up from school and I said, how many days till my birthday? And he said, five. And I said, and how old am I going to be? And he said, 77. I said, you're right. And then he thought for a minute and he said, Gigi, I, I really wish you were going to be 66. And I said, Liam, I said, I'm, I'm healthy. I'm doing really well. He said, I know, Gigi, but you're really getting old. <laughs> and you know, we are really getting old. We are. But we, we are, are a young old. Mm -hmm. We are a young old. Yeah, and well, I, I think that the world can tell us that we need to retire or we need to be content with what we have. And you can do all of those things, but you can still learn to love life again, try things that you may not be, um, you know, going to be as good at as you were at 30, but you can still try. So one of the, the reasons for the book was to, to just provide a book that I wish I had had, just a guide, just let me look at this so I can start thinking. And I know it's important for you to get the members of your community, let's think about this, mm -hmm. let's, let's think. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's hard to do. That's not, and that's not easy to do because most people in their 60s are working, launching children, busy, busy, busy. And so we have to now, find some time, quiet everything down, do a pause and say, okay, let me start thinking about some of these. Where do I want to be? And, and those kind of questions. And that is so important because you stated in your book that when we're in our 20s, we saw 10 years from now, I'm going to do this. But when we hit our 60s, we think like, 
three weeks from now, I'm going to do this or four weeks from now. But you do have to think of all those things. I, uh, a girlfriend of mine who is single, she has this, she has, she said, everything I do, I think about as I age, can, will I be able to do this? She said, mm -hmm. I've changed this in my house. She said, because maybe I won't be married. She said, I don't have children. She said, so I've changed things. She said, I can still do those things, but I want to make sure if I'm still in, able to be in this house, that I can live here comfortably. And she started going over. She said, I started looking for things in my neighborhood. She said, because one day I might not be able to drive as far as I'm going there. So I'll mm -hmm. know what they have in my neighborhood. And she's one of these people that's always been a free spirit. If you said, where are you going now? She said, I'm, I decided I'm going to California and she'll go by herself. So she's always been mm -hmm. that type of person. But I enjoy the book and I think everybody should get it because it's, you make me laugh through part of it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, and I, I wanted to tell my husband because when we when we travel, we travel for different reasons. Uh huh. Once he gets to a spot, he's happy, and I want to go see everything that it had to offer. You know, because I may not come this way again. Um, I go. I look back at my child who is 40 something years old. She is a beach person, but she married another beach person. But she told us one time, she's an attorney. She said, I could quit my job right now, open a little shack on a beach and just be happy. Wow. But that's her. Yeah. You know, after about two or three days, I'll be like, what are we going to do? <laughs> well, when I was um, thinking about the book was finished and I, and I was thinking, okay, what, what am I selling here? What, what's my message here? And my message is uh, three things. My message is aspiration. And you can, you can call that hopes or dreams or whatever you want to do on your to-do list, aspiration, that we have to find that aspiration no matter how old we are. And then we have to be uh, intentional about it. And so I'm selling aspiration and intention. And the most important thing that I'm selling is urgency mm -hmm. because we really don't know if we're going to have the 90 year old life or the hundred year old life. So, um, but we do know that we're in the last third of life. Mm -hmm. So there is an urgency about um, taking action. And I think too, people our age, and I'm 69, I'll be 70 pretty soon in October. People our age, um, like I said, are different than our parents were at the age. But my mm -hmm. one of my close friends passed away last year and she was 95. Mm -hmm. And she still loved to dance. So when they, she was so happy when they brought out line dance and everything, but she would always look at us and say, do what, do all you can while you can. And enjoy life, you know, plan for things to do. So I, I again, I think this is a good roadmap for a lot of people. And I think it's, you know, it's practical. You know, the stories are practical of people. You said, oh, that sounds like my friend Bill. He did that or, or whatever. Mm -hmm. So can you tell us where people can buy your book. It's on Amazon right now. It's getting great reviews. So I would go to any of the online um, opportunities for that. Mm -hmm. And uh, I would only add to, to what you're saying is that um, we are the first generation to really be in the position that we're in being healthy, having a little money in the bank and mm -hmm. looking forward to longevity and all of the scientific and medical like things that have happened to us and that's a bit we are pioneers but we are also role models mm -hmm. and we are role models to our children and our grandchildren and um that's a very important piece of our lives in I, in terms of being a boomer i am laughing because my grandson is 13 and when he was 12 he still has the trampoline i got in the trampoline with him because yes. i was a cool grandmother and my youngest one who's in her 30s said okay we're not going to the emergency room today get out <laughs> just get out but she reminds me all of the time that mom you are getting older and I still work, I still do exercise programs with this same group of people. And we laugh. The trainer told us, because we complain a lot now. She said, remember, y'all, I was a 30-something-year-old when we started. 
I am now 60. She says, so we are all aging together. There are certain things we're just not going to do anymore. Now it's for our health. Again, Barbara, I want to thank you. I just- You're welcome. I, yeah. okay, everybody can see this book. And so I think that people will, they will get something out of this. They really will. It'll, it'll help them on their journey to live in an extraordinary life. And like you said, it's just the little things. You know, you say you always wanted to go here. What's stopping you from going? You know, what's right. stopping you from going? Uh, you say you wanted to paint. What's stopping you from painting? You know, maybe you won't become this famous person, but who knows? It, you In these day and times, it's no telling what could happen. And I think you are very inspirational in your work. So I am blessed to find a reader like you who has, who has embraced what I uh, wanted very much to happen. And that is, let's be extraordinary in the way that we live. Thank you again.